everyone, welcome. This is Virtual CogX and welcome to the Createx stage. My name is Alice Thwaites. I'm a technology philosopher and ethicist, and it is my absolute pleasure to be on a stage at 5 p.m. So we should have put our pens down. It's the end of the workday and we're going to talk about some culture. Culture is so important, especially in a technology driven era, because we as humans are techno social creatures. We are driven by the technology and the community and the sociality and the society and politics around us. And so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce this next section on the virtual and the visual. We're talking about the digital, fu digital future of art. And with me is Susan Boster from the Boster Group to tell you more and moderate this session. Thank you so much and, and welcome everybody. First, a big thank you to the team at COGX for putting together an exceptional lineup at this year's festival. I think I heard this morning with Tabs and Charlie that over 37,000 people have registered and we have over a thousand speakers. Talking about a pivot, wow. Um, I'm Susan Boster and before we get to the talent, uh, let me introduce you to Boster Group. We were founded 20 years ago and we specialize in the development of innovative partnerships between cultural institutions, global corporations, and social impact foundations. COVID-19 shuttered the doors of the art world. The physical experiences of art fairs, auctions, and exhibitions were paused. Galleries and museums quickly established digital strategies to help bring culture into our homes. By many metrics, these efforts have been phenomenally successful with enormous increases in website traffic and social engagement. The British Museum has reported an increase in visitors to their online collection page from 2,000 to 75,000 per day. However, as we look at the long-term future of the art world, commercial and charitable organizations alike are asking how can they take digital engagement to new levels and use exciting virtual concepts as tools to present visual art? How will the art world continue to evolve alongside technology and how will it transform not only our experience of art, but also art itself? Boster Group has seen firsthand how effectively leveraging technology can create access for thousands of underrepresented young people through our work with BNP Paribas platform, Access Art 25, and along with their partners at the Royal Academy. So let's move on. Joining me today to provide some answers to these questions are three leaders in the art world, starting with Victoria Sadal. She's the global director of all Freeze Art Fairs, overseeing the launch of the first Freeze LA last year and the first fully online Freeze New York last month. Freeze began as a magazine and is now one of the most influential art fairs in the world. Ivana Blazwick is the director of the Whitechapel Gallery, a touchstone for contemporary art in London and internationally. She is also a lecturer, an extensively published art critic, and one of her many successes was staging Damien Hirst's first public show. Tim Marlowe, is the chief executive and director of the Design Museum, which was awarded European Museum of the Year in 2018. Formerly artistic director of the Royal Academy of Arts and director of exhibitions at White Cube, Tim is a curator, writer, and broadcaster. I wanna thank all of you for joining us. And it tells me that each and every one of you has a true interest in, in arts and culture. And Matt, if you could, put up our, our special slide here. I wanna draw your attention to the donation links on your screen. If you're able, I wanna give you this invitation and urge you to donate to the Design Museum, Whitechapel Gallery and Studio Voltaire, three cornerstones of London's visual arts and design sectors who deliver outstanding talent development, opportunities and contemporary content from the UK and across the globe. Particularly now, as so many emerging artists and ambitious institutions face the challenges of creating work in lockdown. Any support you can give will help to ensure the resiliency of our beloved cultural sector. Let me start off with Victoria. Victoria, mm -hmm. New York was scheduled to open in early May. After moving to an online platform, the fair received an extremely positive response, especially with regards to the unprecedented levels of transparency 
and access to information. How do you see the current need for digital only platforms affecting the art market in the future? Thank you, Susan. Uh, great to be part of COGX this year. So thank you so much for inviting me and thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, well, this has been, with, goes without saying, an incredibly challenging few months for people across many industries. It's also been an extraordinary period of experimentation, certainly in the art world. Um, and while we had to cancel the physical edition of Freeze New York, um, we took the entire fair online. And the circumstances that we found ourselves in encouraged everyone to really embrace this new format and had some really interesting results. Um, we'd been working on Freeze Viewing Room, which is our online platform for some time, but it was always intended to sit alongside our physical fairs in London, New York, and Los Angeles. Um, but then six weeks before the event, when the virus hit, we pivoted the development of the platform in order to take the whole fair online. So much more was resting on its success at this point because galleries were closed, no fairs were taking place, which meant the art market had almost ground to a halt. So we threw everything into delivering uh, both a successful online platform as well as a feeling of event and community that are such an important aspect of the free fairs. We really wanted the user experience to feel like being part of a freeze fair. So it needed to be a sort of elegant and sophisticated way to view art, as well as being a kind of personal experience. So we had welcome videos from the directors that we filmed ourselves at home. Um, we included sections by uh, museum leaders. Uh, we curated them for us, which you would always find at our fairs. We kind of took those online too. Um, and rather than just images of artworks, like a scroll of PDFs, um, a scroll of JPEGs rather, you could see the works on the platform as you would see them hanging on your wall um, at home with a piece of modernist furniture for scale. Um, and we even added an AR function so you could see them hanging on the wall of your own home. And we also, Susan, you mentioned transparency. We asked galleries to display prices, which is quite unprecedented for an art fair. You would never lose the prices on the wall at a fair. But we thought for this online platform, it was really important to sort of remove any barrier to entry. Um, so I think many people found that fascinating and, and enlightening to us see, you know, sort of not just information about the artists and the works themselves, but that kind of transparency of pricing. Um, and as a result, we know there was art valued at over $360 million on the platform the week of the fair. The results of this were that we had visitors to the online edition of Freeze New York, hosted on Freeze Viewing Room from over 150 countries. Um, we had far more visitors than we would ever be able to host at one of our physical fairs. Um, but visitor numbers, of course, are relatively easy when you can sit at home and just download an app onto your phone. Uh, the big test is gallery sales. Mm. And we had great reports of these. We had work selling up to $2 million, which is a high price, even at a physical fair. And I think there was skepticism beforehand that works at that price level could sell through an online platform. They did. Um, and then some galleries selling up to sort of 20 works each. So this was money going to galleries and artists at a time when it was much needed. In terms of the future of the art market and how it will be impacted by all this, um, as an industry, I feel like we've made great leaps in the past, past few months. There were some galleries who barely had websites who are now generating sales digitally. Transparency of pricing, as we mentioned, has really kind of ignited imaginations. And often it turns out the works are less expensive than people thought they might be. Um, access to information is obviously empowering, but at the same time, we're working out now how to develop the platform to deliver information in the best possible way. We had over 6,000 artworks on Freeze Viewing Room. Um, so our focus is now figuring out how to help visitors to navigate that volume of information going forward. But, you know, the most interesting thing that I think we learned from this, from the whole process, was that the digital format is not a replacement for a live event. You know, it was great that we were able to do this. And this will be something that is invaluable to sit alongside live events going forward. But art is meant to be seen in person. And... You know, I think if anything, this time has kind of reaffirmed that, how much we're all dying to get back into museums, and get back into galleries. And, you know, the magic that happens when you put all these people and artworks under one roof is not something you can re replicate online. So while there's no kind of going back from the digital innovations that have swept the art market in the past few months, um, the future, I think, will be defined by using both the digital and the physical experiences side by side. Thanks, Victoria. Ivana, uh, the Whitechapel Gallery brought this year's Artist 
Film International online completely. How do you see technology shaping art forms like moving image art? Well, it's been a slow and um, fascinating uh, experiment, which has been very, very pioneering. I would say, actually, it goes back over 40 years that artists have grabbed the potential of uh, new technologies, which were analog and which now are increasingly digital. And what's exciting about them is, of course, that even with a mobile phone, you can become a filmmaker or you can become a photographer. And also what the internet has offered up in terms of research, archival materials, uh, the fact that you can explore through the whole history of images and ideas and absorb them into your work. So it's a fantastically rich resource. And as a consequence, I would say over the last decade, we've seen a huge surge in moving image art. It's really taken the art world by storm. It's exciting, it's pioneering and it communicates globally. So we decided that this was a way of harnessing the way that artists have entered the what's been called the electronic superhighway and that we wanted to share that with global audiences. It's also coincided, I would say, with um, the fact that moving image, there's a freedom with moving image work. You can make a film which could be 30 seconds or you can make one for 24 hours. And that differentiates it from conventional cinema where you've got you know, a 90 minute format, a beginning, a middle and an end, an auditorium, all those things that artists have kind of jettisoned. Um, the other really fascinating aspect of this is the global aspect. So we have a global art world. Uh, 20 years ago, we may have thought that it was just in London, New York, perhaps Berlin, but no, it's actually happening in India, in Latin America, in, in Russia. I mean, it is actually happening everywhere. There is great contemporary art, art happening around the world, but without completely destroying the planet and enlarging our carbon footprint to being completely ridiculous, we thought, how can we show our London audiences what's happening in Argentina or, or, or the Middle East? And so we formed a consortium of 20 partners around the world, each of whom uh, has a great curator and they nominate an outstanding talent in their region and everyone in the consortium has been showing the work of a local artist. So I'm delighted to say we have a partner in Los Angeles, in Texas, but also in Mumbai, in Moscow and proudest of all, we have a partner in Kabul, Afghanistan. We also have a new partner in Jordan. So if you imagine for local artists in those kinds of regions, which are hit often by a tremendous civil unrest, austerity, poverty, to have access to artists from all over the world using moving image has been, you know, actually I would say quite revolutionary for them. Conversely, we've been able to platform a young artist from Kabul to audiences in London. Mm. So that was, for 10 years we ran that in physical spaces, but with COVID, that really inspired us to take the whole program online. So right now we're, we're showing an amazing new work from Turkey, for example. And I think it's that sharing of creativity, that multi-perspectival multi understanding of art that also will help, if you like, the politics of the art world, the politics of representation, which have really been brought to the fore over the last week, I would say with events in America. So I think it's got a very powerful ethical role to play. It's also incredibly inspiring to see what artists often with a minimum of resources can turn you know, a simple mobile phone and create a work of genius or access the possibilities of animation that computer technology now gives them. Ravana, that's beautiful. And I love hearing about the way that you're working collaboratively for that solution as well. That's Fantastic. Victoria Nirvana, uh, next question is around, you know, with the promising rise of interest in digital art, how do you envision the future of ownership, exhibition, and authentication? <laughs> Who would you like to go first? Get it. <laughs> um, Definitely one for you. <laughs> um, and I think it's important to state, you know, that it, it, there's, a kind of, there's an interesting thing at the moment where we've spent years, um, actually, well, the last couple of years at least, trying to bring digital art into the physical space of our fairs. And now, of course, we're trying to take 
like more traditional mediums like paintings into the digital sphere mm -hmm. in our online viewing room. Um, but, um, but you know, this has been, as Ivana says, this has been, you know, an, an interesting moment for, you know, for artists all over the world to thrive, particularly those working in digital media because their works can be seen as they were intended to be seen. Um, we had an exhibition of virtual reality art at Freeze New York last year. Um, so well before all of this hit, um, it was curated by Daniel Birnbaum of Acute Art. And, um, and if you're interested in digital art, it's worth seeing what they're doing on their app. They currently have uh, free to use AR works by Cork, or Eliasson that you can kind of like place into your home. Um, in terms of ownership and authentication, I think probably Ivana and Tim best place to talk about um, exhibition. Uh, there is a lot to work out. And, but there are some interesting developments, you know, and we've been speaking to people about this in the process of our development as well. Um, for example, you know, blockchain is kind of changing the way authentication works for the secondary market. Um, and this is something we're thinking about actively because we do have Freeze Masters as well, which shows kind of ancient art, old masters. And, you know, it would be really exciting to be able to take that world online as well. Um, Susan, can I just throw a sort of, left field spanner hit in at this point which is Absolutely. It's, it's it's really heartening to hear the opening up of the art world through technology and I, I i subscribe to that i mean i know that's happening and i'm seeing in art schools an increasing opening up to, to new technology we know that historically and art historically the relationship between technology and art and art and technology is symbiotic and as somebody who's now joined the design museum i'm fascinated by the showcasing and the exploration of technology per se but I think one of the things we have to just be careful of in the opening up and the access and this is where our collaboration is so critically important is that there are many many people in our own country not let alone around the world who don't have access to digital technology and we have to be really careful that we see this as a kind of fully democratic thing you know one of the things that I've always maintained even when I was in the private sector at White Cube was we work with school groups at the Royal Academy, you know, 25,000 school children came to see the Ai Weiwei exhibition. Mm. It's also a process where 16,000 state school children every year actively engage with the Design Museum's Design Ventura, where they can actually come up with an entrepreneurial design scheme that if it wins, it, it, get, it gets put into production. But actually, um, the, the, uh, it, we require museums as physical places where people come together. We can reach many more people through digital technology, but actually we need to start seriously lobbying campaigning trying to do something about the access that schools have for technology because in we call we talk we talk about the post-covid landscape but actually it's not going to be post for a long time we're going to be learning to live with it and actually ivana is going to find i know as i will that school groups are just not going to be able to come to our museums in the way that they've done before and that will apply to a lot of museums around the country and cultural institutions and we have to find ways of getting the digital technology out there that they can actually use it so th so that's first principles that we need to adhere to and of course that's what technological inventiveness can do is make the top technology easier better more fluid more enticing but we have to i think you know r remind ourselves of that point Tim, that's a great point. And to our audience, I was going to do this at the end, but I'm going to say it now. It's not just about donations. We're also inviting you. If you see these, all three of these people and many of, our, of all of our colleagues also run amazing institutions. If you want to partner up with us, bring in your technologies, have ideas. We're open. We're open for business. We're open for that innovation and how to think and talk about that as institutions, in addition to what Tim's saying, which is lobbying at the core level for that access. For people, which leads me to my next question that goes to all of you guys, which is that both the commercial art world and, uh, you know, institutions curating exhibitions like Whitechapel and the Design Museum attract high numbers of international visitors. How do you see the balance between local and global engagement shifting and how will digital strategy augment this? Well, I think that um, we've all found under lockdown, we've all become what someone's recently called hyperlocal. We're shopping locally, we're discovering neighborhoods that we probably never ever knew were there because we were busy commuting into our workplaces. So um, I think there is a heightened awareness of local. I think also with uh, bigger questions about climate change and um, our global carbon footprint, mm -hmm. I think we are going to be looking to be less globe trotting and more 
um, nationally or, or locally based. Um, I agree with Tim that we've got to ensure, for example, that there's broadband. Often people in rural parts of the country, where, by the way, a lot of people are thinking of moving now, there's, there's absolutely hopeless access. And I think that is a, is a government thing that the, the public in rural communities need to get better access. But I do think it's a kind of combination because one of the great things about galleries is that you can move freely through them. You don't need to congregate. You don't need to be in a confined space. So they still, you know, I think it's a kind of combination of the two. The digital and the global will uh, open the doors of perception, if you like, will introduce new voices, new creative visions. What we're hoping is that that, that will be harnessed with a desire to be in a physical space. As Victoria said before, there are many kinds of art that depend on, you know, the tactility, the environment that you're going to experience it in. So to me, it's it's a kind of marrying of the two. Conversely, if you're in a physical space, you can look at your phone and actually find out everything you need to know about the artist, about their biography, about the critical framework, about understanding work of art. So it's a fantastic kind of two-way dialogue, I would say, between the digital realm and the physicality of being in an exhibition space. Oh. Ivana, you've always been public spirited and um, uh, I think that the art world is collegial and collaborative in some ways but I think as museum institutions we've we've often been forced to be competitive for funding, for audience share, for press coverage and, 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 and reach. And I think that this moment, and, and this is someone sitting in a museum where design by definition has to be collaborative. It's such a broad sphere of influence. There are so many aspects to it, um, that this has to be the moment where perhaps the bigger institutions uh, are much more open and collaborative in the way that they operate across the cultural landscape. I think we all, I mean, this may sound again, ideological uh, and, and utopian, but we have to find ways. I love the idea of hyper-locality. I mean, I live, I'm a, I'm a hyper-local of yours actually, it's where I live near your museum, but I cycle across London to the Design Museum. But the idea of re-engaging locally, but that all museums become local hubs rather than obsessing with internationalism by definition we can be international by being hyper local in a funny kind of way and of course we all want global reach and of course the, the the areas that we deal in by definition have global resonance but i think we have to look to be much more collaborative and, and expansive with each other and when you start talking to people in venue you know, theater venues the music industry the performing arts you realize that you know there's going to be a decimation of that landscape and we need to find ways of reaching out across that landscape too as well as our own mm. I would agree. I think you know the, the the levels of collaboration that have come out in the art world, and I'm sure many other industries as well, have been kind of extraordinary and very heartening at this time. I think going back to something Yvonne said, you know, it's important that we don't lose sight of what the big conversations were before COVID hit, and for the art market certainly, it was it was sustainability. As Ivana says, we were all just traveling around the world constantly. It's an incredibly global market and has been very dependent on people and artworks moving, moving, moving around the world constantly, um, which you know was an enormous concern about the impact it was having on the environment, on climate change. So I think in the long term, the engagement can still be global, um, but the digital platforms emerging now kind of will enable us to do that more sustainably. Um, I, think, I, think I, I, I think also that there is um, still a kind of slight fear of museums and galleries as being elite spaces or, you know, not for ordinary people. And one of the great potentials, I think, of the digital platforms, and I agree with Tim, the more we can collaborate, produce material that we can share, audiences that we can share, um, the more I want to get you know, young people, people who feel culture is not for them, engaged in art. Because, you know, we know we're moving into this amazing post-industrial future, what people have called the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, there are factories closing. There are car manufacturers, steel manufacturers that we've heard are going to be reducing their staff. There's going to be a huge shift in the way people live and work. So the digital is central to that, but so is creativity. Uh, so that we're not just passively um, absorbing, you know, consumer goods or looking at ourselves uh, in uh, this rather kind of more narcissistic aspect of the digital community. What I'd like to see is having those platforms spark creativity. 
ideas about making, about ideas about really shaping, having control over our own destinies through creative, through the creative arts. And if we can work together in also breaking down the barriers between people who feel culture is remote, uh, too, too complex or sophisticated, I, I would love to see the digital connect us with uh, all sorts of audiences here and around the world uh, to invite them to engage with contemporary art, possibly for the first time, and uh, see the great riches that they will find there. Ivana, thank you. I have one last question to each of you, if you could give me maybe your top headline. Um, what lessons, or lesson maybe, pick your best, will your organization learn from the current public mm -hmm. health crisis? And what lessons do you think the wider art world needs to carry forward? Victoria. Um, I mean, it has shown us that our community will pull together and collaborate in a crisis and that great things will come out of that. I think it's also shown us as Freeze that, you know, we need partnerships in order to achieve these things. We need to look to other industries as well. You know, for the, the Freeze viewing room, we collaborated with a developer called um, Live It. And like, we couldn't have done this without them. You know, the speed at which we had to get things done forces collaboration in a really interesting way. Um, we've had the opportunity to experiment with a digital fair in a way that would not have happened if we'd not find ourselves in this situation. Um, the art world has been late to digital in many ways and compared to many other industries, but there's really no going back now. Um, and I think, as I said, I think as an industry, we've learned that we don't need to be everywhere all of the time and that this will help us to address issues around sustainability as well. And one final thing is just that, again, back to this the physical encounter with art and with people and the things that we do choose to do in the future, I think will be more meaningful than ever and we'll potentially value them even more highly than we did before. Thank you. Tim. Well, obviously, key lesson, don't appoint a new director CEO a month and a half before a pandemic. That will be one thing to learn. Uh, secondly, always stock up on uh, clippers if you have a sort of hair crisis. Um, but no, I think I think I think it reaffirms the importance of shared communal experience that we often took for granted, but in much more sustainable ways. And I think the power of collaboration, of institutions looking to reach out and help each other and, and knowing that that has to be um, a, a more sustainable way. Uh, I think those lessons are strongly reinforced by all of this. Thank you. Ivana. Um, I would say also uh, participation. Uh, we've had a 20% increase in, in you know, hits and, and followers across all our social media platforms and on our website. But what's really been interesting is everybody within the art world and beyond sharing reading lists, film likes, uh, their reactions to the events of America last week. It's been an amazing uh, series of uh, multi-perspectives and multiple voices. And I've, I've found out so much from just reading all the recommendations that colleagues have posted or sent. Uh, if you go, if you wander out across the art world digital platform tonight, um, there's an astonishing wealth of material out there from, from film to uh, extraordinary reading lists and images. It's really fantastic to actually discover how amazingly knowledgeable and um, exciting all our colleagues are in terms of being researchers of uh, fantastic materials to share. So it's a rich, it's a rich world, and we'd love more people to join it. So you've got it here, you guys. This is your invitation. Join in. I urge you again. Look at the different areas of where you can give to our institutions. You hear our leaders. We have amazing leaders who have pivoted at a very difficult time and continue to lead in a collaborative way with a number of different partners. And um, I, I just urge you to, to reach out and, and talk to them and find a way that you can partner up with them. Thank you so much for joining. And lastly, I wanna invite all of you, I think Matt might put up a slide, to um, join us um, on Wednesday, back on the Create Tech stage at 2 p.m. Um, with uh, the Young Vic's artistic director, Kwame Kwayama, actress and playwright right, Lolita Chakrabarti, and the wonderful actor and director, Adrian Lester, where we're going to be discussing the impact of technology on the future of the performing arts.
Thank you. Thanks.